Hello there. My name is Roberto Delgadillo. I am a student services librarian at the University of California, Davis. And I'd like to introduce you my book selections for Native American Heritage Month. Um, as I begin to display these books, I just want you to know that for me, it's, it's been an honor and pleasure serving as the Native American Studies uh, liaison and bibliographer to the academic community here at UC Davis. And some of the books that I'm going to be talking about are kind of uh, been personal to me, both as an undergrad, grad, and now, you know, working here at UC Davis. Uh, the first one I'd like to begin with is Leslie, Leslie Marmon Silko's Ceremony. I first came across this book as an undergraduate at UC Santa Cruz. And it was a book that in some ways, I read it by the way, for an introduction to community studies class. And I recall being disturbed by it because it was really my first introduction to, well, in essence, the issues, the struggles faced by the Native American community. And specifically, uh, Silco looks at the life of, well, uh, among other things, uh, the, the protagonist anyway, a World War II veteran who is basically coming to grips with the aftermath of World War II and the long-lasting damage that it did, which today we would kind of characterize as post-traumatic stress disorder. And he's coming to grips with it. But more than that, he's also dealing with his legacy of being a Native American and, and being white as well, too. And what Silco does so well as an example of kind of establishing this hybrid discussion and you know prose and poetry um, is kind of in a way of how the main character and the characters that are associated with it are kind of connected to in this particular instance the Laguna Pueblo community and really all Native American communities and some of the issues they struggle with you know whether or not they are war veterans and the need for their to and the centrality rather of ceremonies to kind of cleanse these things and in many ways Kind of heal not only them themselves people but the, the the community and the earth ultimately itself and so the book is a work of fiction is very interesting in the sense that it kind of goes back and forth and the characters are again my first my first introduction to it left me a little bit at times confused but over the years as i've come back to it i realized the beauty and the poignancy and it's not surprising that for that very reason it's been around now for in publication for over 30 years and still remains a standard work that's often given an introduction to Native American studies classes or other classes you know, beyond the, the fields of literature. So for that reason, ceremony is one that's very special to me as well. Also, on another side note, as a military historian, um, the issue sometimes, at least at the time that it was written, um, you know, there, there are some few works that really did talk about the impact that happens uh, to folks returning from war and specifically, you know, PTSD. And so hers was a very sympathetic uh, light, if you will, on this particular issue. Um, the next book that I also came across while as an undergraduate at UC Santa Cruz, and albeit basically as a... Um, in selections, but subsequently reading the work later on, is Dee Brown's famous work, Bury My Heart, It Wounded Me. And basically this is a work of non-fiction. And it really is specifically focusing on the United States relationships with Native American groups in the far west in the late 19th century. Um, it's an interesting book because it was published in the 1970s, and so it has that kind of milieu, if you will, of being captured as the way that Dee Brown especially discusses the unfortunately legacy, unfortunate legacy that the United States government has had towards, well, the politics of genocide towards Native American groups um, and the broken promises, the treaties, and I think the book has gotten a special kind of poignancy because over the years, you know, a lot of more research has gone into, not that you need it, of course, but it just, you know, reveals the pattern, if you will, of, of 
well, mixed relations between Native Americans and the U.S. government. And at the time of its publication, I think the other thing that was uh, gave it a, a sense of poignancy and, and power was the fact that as we were, as the United States was having to endure the legacy of the end of the Vietnam War, and specifically revelations, when I think about it, of the mass, the, the United States massacre of Vietnamese villages, the most famous one being of uh, My Lai. Um, you know, I believe one reviewer said something along the lines of, this was a book that revealed that those patterns that people thought were, you know, somewhat abnormal or not, or somewhat atypical were actually very typical of the way the United States not only treated its, the citizens of this particular, you know, or inhabitants rather, of this particular continent, but since others as well. And as time has gone on, um, well, D. Brown's words still live on, and this is like Silco's ceremony, a book that's still uh, on the reading list, if you will, of a number of just you know contemporary or past uh, Native American studies courses. Um, also, as a side note, uh, like, you know I always think of D. Brown as one of ours in the sense that. He was the agricultural librarian at the University of Urbana, I mean, Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. So there you go. Librarians can also <laughs> not only take care of books, but they can also write them as well. The next book I like to highlight is Crazy Brave by the current, current, the current poet laureate of the United States, who is actually now serving her second term and that would be this particular memoir by Joy Har Harjo. Um, it's a very powerful work. It's also, uh, it's a joyful book, but it's also a sad book as she details her, her experiences growing up and the aftermath of a number of, you know, what obviously can be described as very traumatic um, and a number of struggles. And yet all the while though, that she sends and displays a great sense of resiliency and so I find my I found myself rather connecting a lot with this book um, and the struggles that she's has you know that she has faced and continues to face and yet all the while using music poetry and other creative expressions to kind of well if you will bear through it and kind of give it an example that even in darkest times we can use these elements of creativity to overcome them and so as a result, it's a very hopeful book, though having said that, um, at times it can be a very painful read as she talks about, again, those particular events of, the, of her life that you know, caused her abuse, torment, and struggles. And also she does detail the impact that not just on her, but of the Native American community as well too, that they have also have had to face. Uh, very powerful work, one that I definitely recommend and along those lines, she has written a follow-up, which in a way can be considered a spiritual companion to this. And this is more, it is a memoir, of course, but this one delves more into the creative influences that impacted on her, whether, you know, particular mentors with respect to poetry or those musicians. And again, those other creative outlets that she has used to kind of well, share with the rest of the world. And that, of course, is Poet Warrior. Great book. The next book I like to highlight is the one by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, and that's An Indigenous People's History of the United States. And this one is a bit more systematic than D. Brown's work. If D. Brown's work specifically focused on the United States policies, genocidal and otherwise towards Native American groups in the far west in the late 19th century, this one is more expansive in the sense that it looks at the colonial, post-colonial, um, and postmodern world, if you will, of the United States and those policies that it's pursued towards the indigenous populations, not just within the United States, but outside the United States. So it's a bit more expansive, more comprehensive, and one that definitely complements D. Brown's work. Um, 
it is one of these books and this is in fact if you're aware of an hbo docuseries available now called exterminate all brutes which incorporates some of the text in this book and um, one that's definitely highly recommended um, and again as i said it, it, it covers the again the united states legacy from its colonial era to the present and, and all the issues that are associated and like Lee Brown talks about those patterns of well, betrayal, uh, broken promises, and the impact that they have had on the indigenous populations in the United States and outside of it as well, especially when one thinks about the whole issue of the United States and in terms of empire. The other book and now I'd like to focus on is Joe Sacco's Paying the Land. And speaking of, you know, as I just spoke about Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's book of just looking at the United States, this one is interesting in that it focuses, uh, well, for one thing, it's an example of what Joe Sacco is a, a pioneer of. Well, it's certainly the, the biggest proponent of, of what is referred to as comics, uh, comic journalism. And with his previous works where he's focused on the struggles of the Palestinians or, you know, the folks that, that you know, suffered under the breakdown of the so former Soviet Union and specifically in Bosnia Herzegovina, this time he focuses his attention on Canadians, Canadi Canada's <laughs> indigenous populations, the Dine, in the uh, far northwest. And this is an interesting story because initially it really begins with a, an example of, oh, what has the impact been on resource extraction in these communities? Because the Canada's Northwest region is rich in oil, diamonds, um, and other materials that it needs to continue its economy and around the world as well. But increasingly, what you begin to see as he begins to talk about the way that these resource extractions have impacted these indigenous communities, he presents a complex picture of how these groups both benefit and suffer under these policies. And, you know, it's the sort of thing where, again, it, 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 if anything else, it just highlights that in talking about indigenous communities, as has been obvious with these other works, they are not a monolith and that they are very different, different names, different customs, and in this particular case, different uh, beneficiaries. Some benefit and some obviously do not. And so, but underlying all of that, and this is where the power of the book comes in, he begins to realize, or he shows the reader rather, that as you begin to focus away from resource extraction, in particular fracking, what he really begins to examine and look at at the heart of all of this is really Canada's legacy of its residential schools and the idea that if you wish to deprive and at the heart of resource extraction is that, well, if you separate the land from the people, then you separate the people from the culture. And if you separate the culture, you ultimately destroy the people. So that interestingly enough, in his interviews with elders and contemporary leaders, there is a dichotomy of those who feel, well, we can go back to the old ways, but those were no, they were not so great. Whereas those who embrace the modern ways are coping with those changes, but at a high price, unfortunately. And so this is a very powerful work that ultimately begins as one thing, and yet ultimately takes you in this particular instance, the cruel legacy of Canada's residential schools and the long lasting impact that it's had beyond simply separating in essence, children from their culture and the way that it impacts their day-to-day -day interactions and the way they view their relationship to their lands and ultimately culture. Now, if you will, heading a little south of the border, as is often said, I like to highlight our local uh, work here. This is a book called Witness to the Age of Revolution, the Odyssey of Juan Batista Tupac Amaru. And this was written by a history professor here at UC Davis and our director of hemispheric affairs. And one of the things that I, I find very uh, privileged, if you will, to be working with are the scholars associated with this institute, uh, 
because in their connections with our Native American Studies Department, we look at our indigenous populations north and south of the United States. And so this is an instance, in this particular instance, this is an autobiography in a comic form that uh, Charles Walker and Liz Clark put together that basically looks at the life of Juan Batista Tupac Amaru, and he is the half-brother of Tupac Amaru, the famous leader of what ended up being between 1780 and 1783, the largest indigenous uh, movement against the Spanish crown that unfortunately ultimately failed, but which had had a long and lasting impact on others. And um, Juan Batista's life is an interesting one because he was going to spend the next several decades as a prisoner of the Spanish before he was finally liberated by Argentines and lived out his, you know, his old age in Buenos Aires, but never able to return to Peru and was able to document the, you know, what exactly happened and how it happened and <clears throat> the way the Spaniards treated those populations. And so it kind of provides a nice examination, if you will. If, if Joe Sacco looks at the North, this was a good example of looking at the South. And it's a very good opening, if you will, to looking at the way these populations in this very specific historical episode, um, Europeans, if you will, have treated indigenous populations. The power of the book that I also find very appealing is the fact that the first part really begins with a, a comic narration of, you know, the, the, well, in essence, the 30 plus years, more close to 40 plus years that Juan Batista had to endure in writing his autobiography and detailing what had happened with that particular indigenous movement. Um, but the second part is appealing to me as a historian because there, and the, and the other part as well too, the third part, is when, in which Chuck Walker is able to take primary source documents and kind of give you and walks you through the way historians use these primary sources to construct these stories. Because initially when Juan Batista wrote his autobiography and works associated with his struggles, they were initially characterized as false or anecdotal or maybe they happened, maybe they didn't. And so the, the veracity was always in question. And what Chuck Walker is able to do is to show that, along with other scholarship, he's able to show that, no, he pretty much captured it correctly as to exactly what happened. And so we can expect more, I hope, from, from associated scholarship coming from this very book. Um, and also, I just like comics, graphic novels in general. Finally, the last book I want to talk about is one that's written by the current director, I believe, of the Native American Studies Institute at the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, a gentleman there by the name of, uh, let's see now, William J. Bauer, Jr. And he wrote an interesting book that I'm actually, I have to confess, I'm still working my way through called California Through Native Eyes. And this is a re-envisioning of California's history, but obviously using and incorporating those materials, oral histories, or other documents from a Native American perspective, as opposed to what is usually presented in the official archives or the official histories. And so it's an eye-opening examination of the, again, the Native American perspective of various episodes in California history and the way, obviously, uh, in the just the far west, if you will. Um, as I said, I'm still working my way through this one, but I'm enjoying it a great deal. Great piece of scholarship and one I definitely highly recommend. Uh, finally, my last one, and this is for those of you out there that are wanting or being interested in children's books or in this particular in this particular academic library if you have children's collections i cannot help but recommend carol lindstrom's and michaela Gurri's we the water protectors a beautiful it's a children's book <laughs> but it's also the they both won by the way the what's known as the calicut award so that's why i particularly highlighted um, but it's also, as I said, it's a very beautiful book. It's a poignant story uh, about the role of, you know, female water protectors and 
again, kind of ties in nicely with this issue of resource extraction and, and what happens and the discussions and intersections with mythology. In other words, it's just like most children's books, it, there, there's far more beneath the surface than one just thinks of, oh, it's a children's book, this isn't the nice and beautiful little images. There's a lot to consider, and so um, definitely one that I recommend uh, if you do, in fact, at least from an academic point of view, if you have those children's literature collections, or if not, get it on your own, and certainly one that I obviously suspect has already been bought and used, uh, checked out rather, by a number of public libraries. And with that, I end my selections for Native American Heritage Month. Hope you enjoy.